right, limited atonement. Uh, and here is a Calvinist definition of limited atonement. The doctrine of limited atonement is simply that the cross of Christ provides a sure, secure, and real salvation for everyone God intended it to save and for them alone. Okay? So Christ did not die for everyone. Okay, now you probably think, but I thought the Bible said he did. Well, the Bible does say that. <laughs> okay, the Calvinists managed to interpret all of the verses that say world and whosoever and etc. Um, into meaning the elect. They have no basis for that. They cannot give you a Bible verse that says that that world means elect, but they just always keep that in mind and they'll put it in their, their marginal notes in their Bibles, okay, that elect or world means elect, whosoever means elect, and so on. Um, they won't give you a Bible verse to back it up, but they'll say that. Okay, um, that quotation was from a fellow named Grover Gunn. Uh, who is one of the lesser known Calvinists, but he agrees with all the rest of them. Um, here's another one from a couple of guys, Steele and Thomas. Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secured salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary endowment, or pardon me, endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specified sinners. Okay, so God in eternity past looked down over the entire human race and somehow or other decided that he's going to, to pick you, 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 you and you and leave out all the rest. Okay, and Christ only died for those whom he chose to save. Um, if man has anything to do with salvation, including exercising faith, anything to do with it, then God is no longer sovereign in their minds. Okay, which I think is a ridiculous proposition, but that's what they believe. Um, the Calvinists reason that if Christ died for all, then everyone would be saved. Okay, now again it goes back to sovereignty. If God is the sovereign of the universe, it is not possible that He could make an offer to anyone that they are capable of refusing, rejecting. Okay, if, if I were God, and you should be glad I'm not, uh, if, if I were God and I decided I'm going to give this watch to Terry, I'm not, okay? <laughs> but if I were and I was God, then it would not be possible for Terry to decline the offer, okay? And if he could decline the offer, then I would no longer be the sovereign of the universe, okay? That's their reasoning. That, this is why TULIP exists. They're wrong on sovereignty. So they have to come up with TULIP. The Bible, I think, makes it clear that salvation is not something that God secured for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It is something that He provides for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but which He says we must accept by faith. Okay? The Calvinist says God regenerates you and then gives you the gift of faith and then you believe. So you're regenerated. What's another term for regeneration? Born again. You're born again before you believe? Doesn't that seem to be contrary to quite a few verses in the Bible? And the whole idea a person can be saved 
I mean, that's what born again is, right? If you're born again, you're saved, you're a child of God. That's the new birth is being born of God. So you're saved before you ever believe. You know what? That's screwball. Okay, I'm sorry, but that, that, that makes no sense at all. Okay? Now, let, let, me, let me say this, because when I use terms like screwball, uh, or hogwash, or baloney, or, you know, things like that, many, 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 many Calvinists are brilliant people. They are thorough scholars. Unfortunately, they study the wrong stuff. Okay, they need to study more Bible. Throw away the theology books, or at least put them on a back shelf for a while, and get to the Bible. Okay, that's what they need to do. Um, they also, many, many, many times, are good people. They're not nasty. They're not unkind. They're not wicked. Okay? They, they may be as good or better than most of us. Okay? They happen to be wrong. Okay? That's the problem. Good people can be wrong. And they're wrong. At least on these things. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So Christ is the Savior of everyone. He's, he's, salvation is for all. But it's only effective for those who accept it. You have to believe. There's so many verses that say you have to believe. And if you don't believe, you don't get the salvation. Okay, without faith you have no salvation. You believe and you have it. Okay, so it's available for everyone. And I think the Bible is quite clear. Uh, let me give you some verses here. Uh, the Bible in some places says Christ died for some people. Oh, some people. Yes, He did. He died for some. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Jesus died for the church. Okay? That's, that's very clear. Jesus died for the church. Matthew 1.21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay? He died for his people. Um, Acts 5.31, uh, him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus died for Israel. Okay, wow. Of course by Calvinist logic that should mean that all of Israel is saved. But they're not. Okay. Um, okay, these verses are true. But they are not exclusive. You notice the absence of the word, and I mentioned this the last time I was here, you, you don't see the word only in those verses. He didn't die for only the church. He didn't die for only His people. He didn't die for only Israel. Okay, if I say Jesus died for me, He paid for my sins, does that mean He didn't die for yours? By saying He died for me, I'm not excluding you. And God certainly is not excluding you. Okay? Did He die for some certain categories and classifications of people? Yes, He did. Did He die for certain individuals? Yes, He did. But He also died for all the other individuals. Okay? Um, unlimited atonement. And here's some verses that I think show that it's unlimited. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Guess what, beloved? That's everybody. We all fit in that category. Okay? We all do. Um, John 1.29 the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Everybody's included. 
Um, 1 Timothy 1.15 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in, into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And the Bible says, for all have sinned. So everybody's covered by that verse. Okay? Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the lost is everybody until they come to Christ. Okay? Um, Okay, the next verse is the very best verse in the Bible on this subject. Okay, the very, very best. If, if you want to remember one verse for this point, this is the one to remember. 1 John 2, 2, and He is the propitiation, which means the satisfaction. He satisfied the holiness and the wrath of God, the justice of God, when He died for us. He is the, the propitiation for our sins. He wiped out our debt that we owe God. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, the other day I saw a Catholic, or pardon me, a Calvinist Bible. I saw a Calvinist Bible with notes, okay? And they made that He's the propitiation for our sins. That meant the Jewish people, Jewish believers, the Jewish elect. But not for ours only, also for the sins of all those other kinds of people out there. Not each and every individual, by whole world, He doesn't mean the individual people, but the various ethnic groups and that sort of thing, okay? Which, if you read 1 John, he speaks to my little children. He's very, very clear. He's talking to born-again people and, and not categorizing them, not dividing them up and saying, well, this is for you Jewish saints, okay? No, it's for born-again Christians. All right? Uh, he says later on in 1 John that, that we're the born ones of God. Um, so he's the propitiation for our sins, the people that believe in Christ, for, for God's children, God's people. He died for our sins, but not just for us. He died for all those people out there that don't know him who could come to know Him and become one of us now. Okay, He died for the whole world um, and, and not just people groups or something like that. They've got their ways and means of trying to explain and get out of these verses, but just read them and accept what they say. Okay, you don't need somebody to twist them and distort them and pervert them. Okay, just read the Bible and see what it says. Um, okay, anyway, there's other things I'm tempted to, to add that I don't have time to. Um, okay, so that's limited atonement. Jesus died for a certain few people. And beloved, look at this world. It is very, very, very few. What percentage is it? Okay, the seven billion people in the world, 1.1 billion, roughly the last statistics I saw, over one billion claim to be Christians. Okay, now at one time, I claimed to be a Christian, but I wasn't. I, was, I went to a church that was a Christian church, but I didn't understand the gospel. I had not put my faith in Christ. There are probably a number of you who could say the same thing. Yeah, I went to church most of my life, and then bingo, I understood John 3.16 or some similar verse, and I put my faith in Christ and Him alone, and I was saved. Okay. 
claiming to be a Christian, having the name or walking in, into the doors occasionally of a Christian church never made anybody a Christian. Okay? So out of that 1.1 billion who name the name of Christ, how many are truly born again? If every one of them was, one out of seven is what, 14% of the whole world that God chose? Okay, and of course, the percentage is really much, much, much smaller. I would say it's probably more like one or two or three percent of the whole world are actually God's children through faith in Christ. All right? Um, and Jesus only died for them. Um, let me ask you this. What would Christ have had to do to expand that payment for sin to include let's say one more person he chose one more one additional person that he decided I want him to go to heaven what would Jesus have had to do shed a little more blood hang on the cross a second or two longer you know, a little bit more agony, a little bit more pain. What would he have had to do? Our sin was paid for by Jesus' death on the cross. There's no way to increase that. And if that death was sufficient for us, why isn't it sufficient for the rest? 